Good morning, everybody. Sorry for the late start, but I understand we had uh, metro complications. Um, but I want to welcome everybody here. Uh, this will be the best day of traffic so far, so, so celebrate that. And I also want to welcome you to the US Institute of Peace on International Peace Day. Uh, my name is Nancy Lindborg. Uh, we are celebrating our 30th year at USIP this year. It's also 30 years ago that uh, International Peace Day was established. So one starts to think about what was going on 30 years ago that there was this big push to elevate and amplify the whole notion and idea of peace. And it's, I think, an important moment for us all to, to stop and, and think about that and reflect upon that as we're seeing you know, a world that has this sense of increased crisis around the world and conflicts uh, that are dominating the headlines. And without question, there has been an uptick in conflict over the last decade, but it's against a backdrop of greater peace. And one of the things that we're hoping to really um, look at through the International uh, Day of Peace today is the fact that the majority of the world wakes up every day and is peaceful and does things that make their families, their communities, and their countries safer. And so we've launched the Peace Day Challenge, and we urge you before you leave today, if you haven't already, uh, to go online, hashtag Peace Day Channel, or www Peace Day Channel Challenge, excuse me, Peace Day Challenge, Dot org and post your commitment. What is it that you are doing uh, every day that contributes to a more peaceful world? Because sometimes we get caught up in the headlines. Um, and as we look at where is that uptick in conflict, where is this sense of rising conflict happening, more and more it's happening in countries that we think of as fragile, as either weak, with weak governments that can't serve the needs of their people, or illegitimate in the eyes of their citizens. And if you look at the, the flood of refugees coming out of the Middle East, most of those people are coming from countries that are fragile. They're either ineffective or they're illegitimate. And we see that through that swath of Africa uh, and Central Asia that's also contributing to the refugee flows, Yemen, uh, Eritrea, um, Afghanistan and then the additional conflicts where people aren't able to get out, Central Africa Republic, um, uh, South Sudan. Uh, when we look at fragility, when we look at countries that are trapped in those spin cycles of conflict, we understand that key for moving out of these conflicts is this whole notion of reconciliation. And in one of the really interesting frameworks that has emerged, uh, the Fragile States uh, G7 Plus group that has put forward the New Deal for Engagement in Fragile States. They talk about reconciliation as one of the critical steps uh, for moving out of conflict. And so what we would like to do today, and we're so pleased to have all you here with us, is really probe more deeply this notion of reconciliation. What is it? How does it work? How do we ensure that it's not backfiring? And I'm pleased to have with me today four of my colleagues who have really put a lot of their career, energy, um, inquiry, and expertise into this topic. And we have with us, uh, uh, first of all, so I'll introduce all of them, and then we'll go into a lively conversation to which we will invite you to participate. Um, Lily Cole, who is the senior program officer in our center for Applied Research on Conflict, um, where uh, Lily conducts re research and analysis on post-conflict reconciliation practices. Um, and she's looked at how reconciliation and related concepts can really be put to practice in the field. She manages our fellowship programs. She's done a lot of writings, which you can find on our web, and looked at human rights, historical memory, and justice following uh, violent conflict. She's also been at the Asia Society and at the Carnegie Council and Columbia University. So Lily's one of our in-house experts on um, reconciliation. Um, we also have with us uh, Ginny Bouvier, who's our senior advisor for inclusive peace processes and our resident guru on the Columbia peace process. Um, Ginny has been here since 2006, where she's worked on the Columbia peace process. and. 
um, will have a lot to say about that. I really don't know anyone who's more knowledgeable than she is and has worked harder on trying to make that a successful, inclusive peace process. Previously, she was uh, um, at the University of Maryland as a professor on Latin American literature and also with WOLA and a whole host of organizations where her expertise on these issues um, has been um, an important feature of her career. Uh, we also have uh, Sarhang Hamasaid, who's our senior program officer for the Middle East and North Africa programs at USIP. He's been with us since February 2011 and is the uh, key person on moving forward our Iraq programs. Uh, he's done extensive uh, analysis and writing on Iraq and having just returned from Iraq a couple of days ago, I can tell you reconciliation is one of the critical features of the dialogue there right now, and I look forward to hearing what uh, uh, Sarhan can tell us more about that uh, with his long experience. Finally, we have Susan Hayward, the Director of Religion and Peacebuilding. Uh, Susan directs USIP's efforts um, to advance uh, conflict prevention, resolution, and reconciliation projects in the religious sector. She has, for the last four years, uh, moved forward our overall programming in Myanmar, Burma. Um, and uh, since 2007, uh, here at USIP, she's focused on Colombia, Iraq, uh, Burma, Sri Lanka, all places with enormous needs for reconciliation and looking at how uh, the faith community is a part of that. Um, she's been coordinating an initiative looking at the intersection of women, religion, and conflict, and peace building in partnership with the Berkeley Center at Georgetown. Um, and the World Faiths Development Dialogue. And because I know she won't, I'm going to hold up. She has a brand new book, Women, Religious, and Peace, Religion and Peace Building. Susie, you'll tell people how they can get a copy of this. It's a, it's a great book. It's what? Amazon.com. Amazon.com. It's a, a wonderful look at how women, religion, and uh, peace building intersect. So please help, join me in welcoming the panel. Uh, We'll start with a few questions, and then we will be taking questions both from the audience and from those who are watching online. Uh, so get your, get your thoughts ready. But Lily, I want to start with you, and then I may go down the table and ask everybody to chime in on this, because we hear a lot about reconciliation. It's one of those words that gets thrown around. Um, and yet, it has a lot of different meanings, uh, depending on who is saying the word. And it has resonance that can be enormously positive, or it can also uh, feel to those who have suffered great injustice like their voice isn't being heard. But Lily, you've done a lot of writing on that. Why don't you start us off with how, how should we develop a common understanding of reconciliation? Well. I think perhaps the answer is that we may not be able to. It may be very dependent on context. Um, and certainly the definitions really have to be probed to make sure that they're not imposed from the top. And I think um, we might follow uh, some very um, powerful recent studies that have tried to develop indicators really from the bottom up, um, asking, uh, finding methodologies to ask ask local people themselves how they define um, reconciliation. There's quite an interesting one going on right now for peace indicators, the Everyday Peace Indicators Project. And we're going to have um, one of the uh, main uh, uh, investigators working with us as a fellow, actually, on exactly that project to try to define, uh, help people define the term themselves for the particular um, context. So they have all these contexts are quite different. and. Uh, the word reconciliation is considered, uh, many parts of the word, very loaded, very Western, and very Christian. And in some places, it's very popular, and some people actually have other conceptions. Um, can, can you, or really can any of our panelists, give us an example, maybe just to ground the conversation of where reconciliation has been not received well because it has you know, come in from outside the peace process or in the post-conflict environment? I'll just say quickly, because then I think the word should, should go um, actually to Ginny. One of the places where I think of that it was not popular at all is a lot of Latin America, especially the Southern Cone, where it meant uh, compromise and avoidance of justice. 
and um, there's a very strong discourse of justice. And it may be one reason why in the study we did, we did not get a lot of response to our call for projects, which we did a mapping of projects around the world that are intended to further reconciliation. We didn't get much of a response from Latin America, and part of that could be that the word itself is not what people would be using. But I think my understanding is with um, Colombia, there's actually a change in the approach to that term itself. Ginny? I, I think that's right. I think about Argentina. If you had brought up the idea of reconciliation with Argentines who had suffered under a dic military dictatorship for so many years, um, they would understand it as what they would say, borrón y cuenta nueva, you know, let's turn the page and forget about the past. Nobody's judged, no accountability. Um, how, can, how can you reconcile when there is no truth being told and there's no, no justice for it? Um, in in Colombia, it's been very surprising to me to watch the the growing uh, embrace of reconciliation as a concept. Um, I remember probably in 2007 or 8 going down, and we were support, supporting a project in a place called Arauca, um, and we're, we were supporting an international congress on reconciliation. It was the first one ever. The term was very new. Uh, we had been supporting some citizen commissions on reconciliation to create dialogues about what does reconciliation even mean, because it was so it was so unclear. It was a it was just a concept that was out there, and people were trying to really ground it. Um, and at this international congress on reconciliation, I remember somebody getting up and saying, "Well, you can't have peace without reconciliation." And I thought, now this turns everything that I've understood from the international world's vision of of reconciliation on its head. Because ordinarily you think about peacekeeping, troops going in, you know, kind of stabilizing an area. Then you think of a peacemaking process, a, a peace process taking place. Then peace is supposed to come, and then reconciliation comes after the construction of peace. Of peace. But here my colleagues in Colombia were saying, well, we can't even think about a peace process until we have reconciliation. And this really, I think people were starting to see that in the midst of war, and I think this is one of the big differences with Colombia, you have people talking about reconciliation while the war is still going on. Yes, there's a peace process in Havana that's been going on for almost three years, but the fact is that the war is still very much present in many communities. The deaths are still happening. Um, there's still a climate of intimidation. People are still fearful of speaking out and talking about what happened, but they're struggling. Somehow they recognize that years of war has really broken a lot of relationships, and they're struggling to reconnect with neighbors, reconnect with churches, establish, establish organizations after a period where social, being a social leader is a real risk. People are killed for being human rights defenders. They're killed for being affiliated with human rights defenders. So I think the idea of talking about reconciliation is also an effort for civil society to kind of get its own, um, get its own soul back. Um, they're really looking for a way to be human in the midst of war. And I think for many people, without defining precisely what it means, it's, it's a struggle to find wholeness within a broken society. I, I want to jump to Susie. I'll come back to you, Sarhang, because there is a quote in your book uh, where someone talks about helping both the victim and the victimizer rediscover their humanity. Uh, as a part of this process. And so I wonder, just keen off of what Ginny said, if you could comment a, a bit more about how you see religion and some of these faith concepts playing a role in, in bridging into the rec a, a reconciliation process. Yeah, I mean, just in terms of the ideas, I think the term itself, reconciliation, as Lily alluded to, is um, a, a term that is sort of rife with a lot of um, Christian, especially Judeo-Christian theological understanding. So to the idea of reconciling people who have caused harm to one another, um, it, it alludes to as well the idea of reconciling one to God that is a, a central part of the understanding of what um, the very work of faith is. And so these ideas um, permeate even the institutional processes that have developed over time about how reconciliation is advanced to the idea that the, the sort of normative reconciliation process within the international systems, um, especially having come out of the, the process in South Africa, which was, of course, led by Desmond
Desmond Tutu um, had a very um, religious overtone to it, um, focuses on this idea of acknowledgement, of apology, of confession, of truth-telling, of um, forgiveness, and of moving forward. And these are, of course, it, this is a, a religious process in some ways. And so I think that there, there are very real ways in which religious ideas and religious concepts have, have shaped our understanding of what is necessary and in ways that, that maybe come out of the Judeo-Christian process. And one thing that I've heard, especially in Sri Lanka, for example, is a lot of resistance to reconciliation precisely because it's seen as a very Judeo-Christian term mm -hmm. and the ways in which it's been defined internationally, the process and the mechanisms for it are seen to reflect some of those Judeo-Christian understandings of what's necessary in order to reconcile people to one another in the aftermath of violent conflict. And so there's been some really robust discussions amongst the, the Buddhist community there about what reconciliation means within Buddhist frames and about what Buddhist scriptures and teachings have to offer about what's necessary in the aftermath of suffering caused between individuals, between groups, between the state and communities in order to restore right relationships. And the, interesting that you bring up Sri Lanka and, and the Judeo-Christian framing because Sarhang in Iraq, which is yet another faith tradition, Muslim, uh, among with many others with the mosaic of minorities there. But re reconciliation is, is being talked about at almost every level based on my recent visit there. H how is that word understood and how do you see those processes playing out in a country that's torn apart with conflicts in, in many directions? Um, <clears throat> thank you. I think uh, the definition uh, of reconciliation in Iraq is probably one of the uh, problems where there isn't disagreement. There is no. It, everybody understands uh, reconciliation to mean different things, and the, uh, the elements that affect uh, that interpretation it has historic roots, it has rel religious roots, not as in the interpretation of the religion as much as uh, sectarian uh, powers in the region uh, influencing uh, that understanding. And then there is the, the ethnic uh, dimensions of it, whether you look at it from uh, uh, Kurds, Arab, or uh, Iranian, uh, Persian, uh, uh, Arab. And if you take it into the context of Iraq today, uh, most, most of the people talk about it in the terms of the political reconciliation. Now, National reconciliation, and by that, it's it's a more even though uh, n nobody gave it a, 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 a definition. Uh, if you really look into it, is that how what, what is the what, how do the different components of Iraq coexist with each other uh, in peace? And that formula uh, ha has not quite come into place because there is a lot of mistrust between the different groups. Uh, there are some of it are, are historic, some of it are new uh, matters that have complicated uh, new tensions, uh, whether economic or political. So today, when you talk about reconciliation uh, at the very national level, uh, people are still struggling with the very existential questions of Iraq. How do the different communities in Iraq can coexist with each other, and that formula has not been found. This, it has been more complicated um, uh, recently by the conflict uh, with the uh, uh, with ISIS, with Daesh, uh, because uh, it changed the meaning of reconciliation at the local level. Uh, when with them taking different parts of Iraq and different people on the different communities siding with one side of the conflict, either siding with uh, ISIS or siding with the government or not siding with anyone, just leaving their places of origin uh, has changed the meaning of, of reconciliation. Who do you reconcile with? And uh, what does that mean? What, what's the point of time that you return back to? For those who have have lost people in this conflict, uh, then the, name, the meaning of reconciliation has changed from the national coexistence of the different communities into actually coexistence with their very, your very neighbor that some of them, especially the minorities, accuse of being part, uh, participants in some of the crimes that have been perpetrated uh, against them. So so definition is important. Which point of time do you get back to is important. Because for example, uh, those who have had seen a lot of atrocities at the hand of the Ba'ath party under Saddam Hussein, for them, uh, the, the, it could Im Im immediately uh, trigger anger and say, OK, do you want me to reconcile with somebody who has ha blood on his hand, killed my relatives? For the minorities in Iraq today, would, it, they would say, do you want me to reconcile with somebody who's uh, affiliated with ISIS and, um, and has blood on his hand. So it's very, very complex. 
Thanks, Sir Hung. And you know, it really underscores the tension of the relationship between the notion of reconciliation and one of accountability and justice on the one hand and forgiveness on the other hand. And I, I'll ask anyone who wants to respond to that, have we seen processes that have straddled those tensions in a way that enables it, everybody to move forward with both forgiveness and accountability as a part of a reconciliation process? Well, I, I think that's what the Colombians are trying to do. Now, whether they're able to do it or not, uh, we'll see. About a little over a year ago, there was a declaration on principles regarding victims that was signed by both the FARC and the Colombian government at the peace table. And this was a very interesting document that I think is a, a kind of model for how to deal with victims. It, it talked about, it had 10 principles. The first principle is you have to recognize the victims. And this has actually ended up being a very hard thing to do because everyone has a different idea of who has been victimized and what exactly the conflict is and when it started and who's at fault. So it's not only recognizing the victims but recognizing responsibility for victimization. Um, and then I think there's a, a very strong and powerful um, discourse about satisfying the needs of the satisfying the rights of the victims, not just the needs of the victims, the rights of the victims to truth, justice, reparations, and guarantees of non-repetition. And I think many of the reconciliation projects that you see going on around Colombia, and there are not that many. I mean, this is, this is kind of a new and emerging field in some ways. But I think many of these projects are geared toward understanding what would satisfy the victims', victims rights to truth especially, and I think there you have all the historical memory projects that come in, um, but also to justice and reparations, and how do you guarantee non-repetition? And I think there's kind of a, a sense that if you fulfill these other rights, and you fulfill the human rights of victims and of the society, that there will be a kind of an automatic guarantee of non-repetition. I think this is actually an area where very little work has been done and much is needed. Um, how do we know that it won't be re something won't be repeated again? Um, is it enough to know the truth of what happened to automatically assume that it won't happen again? Um, or does there need to be some accounting for it? If the military say we did it for the honor of the nation and we're not going to apologize because that was what we were supposed to do, um, I think you're, you're up against a, a brick wall in a way because you don't get the accountability, you don't get the social recognition that something wrong has happened. Um, and without having that recognition of, of responsibility of wrongs done, I think you're, you're likely to have a repetition. Um, so these guarantees are important. The other, uh, one of the other really revolutionary concepts I think that came out in this Declaration of Principles has to do with the participation of victims. That, that is that the parties in Havana recognize that this isn't something that can be done without the victims. The victims have to be part of this. And to that end, they called on the United Nations, they called on the National University, they called on the Colombian Conference of Bishops, and asked them to help organizing both forums around the country for victims, in which some 3,000 victims participated in different regions of the country. Um, and they also organized delegations of victims, uh, five different delegations of a dozen victims each. And these were, you know, the care that went into selecting who would go to Havana was huge. And it caused all sorts of controversies because you get right to the crux of who is a victim. Are the military victims? And in fact, military were included among the victims. Are the political prisoners of the ELN and the FARC victims? And in fact, they had a video of a, a FARC prisoner that was presented before Havana. I mean, I think there was the widest possible level of interpretation of who was a victim to try to be as inclusive as possible and to recognize that the entire society has been victimized by the conflict. But we say that, and I, I automatically, a red flag goes up and say, the conflict is not the actor here. There are people and institutions 
that are responsible. And you need to define what those responsibilities are as part of the guarantees of non-repetition. Um, I could go on and on, and I won't. I'll cut it off here. But um, if you're interested in these principles on, on the victims, I have a blog, and I actually translated it. And you can find it on my blog and go in and, and see kind of what the, what the state of the art is in Colombia. But I think they're trying very hard to make the victims the center of a process. Um, but we don't know. They agreed to not have an ex to not exchange impunities. That was the language that was used. But they're in the middle of the discussions on transitional justice now, and we don't know how much justice there will be. It, it's interesting. We hosted uh, President Ashraf Ghani here in March or April, I think, and he was asked this question about what would be transitional justice as a part of the reconciliation with the Taliban. And he had a very thoughtful, uh, very nuanced answer that noted that you have to understand everybody believes that they have legitimate grievances. Uh, and it's a tough position to take when you feel so certain that the other side is uh, operating from you know, a base of utter injustice and, and uh, uh, t uh, doing terrible atrocities. But Susie. Well, this, I think this is the hardest question to answer for reconciliation is the relationship. You know, this gets, this gets played out institutionally in truth commissions and transitional justice processes and what's the relationship between them and how will they feed into and out of each other and will there have to be compromises on one side or the others in order to um, meet the needs that, that both have for the communities. And I don't think there's one answer to this. I think that it's has played out differently in a lot of different contexts and that will, it will continue to based on what the local communities decide is necessary for accountability and for moving forward and where the, where the lines are there. Um, I just want to give one anecdote in um, Sri Lanka. We've been supporting a lot of religious peace building work that's been going on there on the ground. Um, since 2007, and in the aftermath of the military defeat of the Liberation Tigers of Tamil Elam in 2009, um, there was a lot of calls for reconciliation and for accountability and so on, but there wasn't a lot of space for it politically. And so it was a lot of the religious leaders and actors and institutions who on the ground were doing some work in order to advance some of that in the absence of state processes of doing it, or authentic state processes. Um, to advance that. And my, um, the, the local organization with which we work there did a really interesting exercise when they began working with some of the religious leaders and introducing them to the concept of reconciliation, the processes and mechanisms for reconciliation, and some of these tensions within the very concept of reconciliation. So they put in each of four corners of a room, they put the terms justice and accountability, truth, mercy and compassion and forgiveness. And then they said to the religious actors who were there, who were Muslim, Christian, Buddhist, and Hindu, go to the corner of the room that you think reflects the component that's most important to achieve reconciliation in Sri Lanka. And it broke down almost um, to the person by religion or ethnicity. So um, the Christians went to forgiveness. The, um, the Muslims went to justice and accountability. The um, Buddhists went to truth, the need for truth telling. And um, the Hindus went to mercy or compassion. And then, and then that launched a sort of robust conversation about, um, about the different elements, about how they feed into and out of one another, and sort of a resolution at the end of the day that they're all important, and there's no one necessarily starting place, but they all have to interweave with one another in the process of it. Um, but one thing I also want to circle back to is, um, is something I alluded to at the beginning, which is that the need for reconciliation in the midst of violent conflict, especially in a situation of internal state conflict, is not just reconciliation between groups of people who've been at war with one another, but reconciliation between the state and the people. Because oftentimes, the, the citizenry as a whole or particular groups within the citizenry have felt that they couldn't trust their government, or that the government was treating them as a threat to the state. They couldn't trust the state to provide security. They couldn't trust the state to provide fair rule of law and judicial processes for justice and accountability. So the, the role of some of the transitional justice or justice processes are not just about accountability for past grievances. Certainly, that's, that's you know, a primary component of it. But one 
um, one aspect of it as well is about reconciling the citizenry with the state, being able to trust the state again, being able to trust the judicial processes to act with, um, without discrimination and with equality towards all groups and to be able to address grievances in a legitimate way. And so that's in, in the process of accountability and justice making, it's just as much about the state being able to demonstrate that it can respond well to the grievances community, that it can treat all communities in a fair way. And, and as transitional justice is done and the various mechanisms for it are considered, whether domestic or international or hybrid versions and so on, that need for at the end of it to create some reconciliation between the state and its people is just as important to bear in mind. Yeah, uh, Lily, go ahead, and then I'm going to ask Sarhang to talk about exactly that dilemma in the context of Iraq. But go ahead, Lily. Yeah, I was going to say that <clears throat> I'm not sure we have a wonderful example that exists of where the two processes work together that, that you ask about, Nancy. But I think it might be interesting to think, too, where nothing has happened at all. There have been no, um, no justice processes and no public reconciliation processes and no discussion to see uh, what, what, what the picture looks like in the absence of those. And even though we aren't actually working in Indonesia, we just hosted um, the second film in the series by Josh Oppenheim that followed the time of killing. It's the act of the act of the act of killing. This was the look of silence, and um, you know, briefly, as you may know, in the '60s there were massive, massive atrocities, mass killings in Indonesia, uh, ostensibly as an anti-communist um, reaction, and uh, these are have been completely silenced. The state absolutely one there. There's been no official accountability or recognition of victims. And in fact, the victims still have dossiers that mark them out as leftist Marxists, enemies of the states, and it, it, incre it, it uh, relates to their descendants as well. And what I think these two films, as well as uh, the research of the anthropologist Leslie Dwyer and a uh, similar film also that's less well known, Rob Lemelson's film, um, these by outsiders particularly have shown that um, basically with no processes at all, these people have simply been silenced by complete terror. And um, the uh, effects, the um, um, kind of warping effects within the society and the continuation of high levels of violence. I just saw um, a study of continuing levels of violence over the years in Indonesia remains very high. Many, many parts of the country, their um, reactions are, seem to um, go to either inter, inter um, ethnic intercommunal violence, and, and there's violence by the state of, as well. So I think the cost there is so high. While we know that these processes don't always work, and there's better and better empirical studies. This is what one thing we've found, um, and we have a workshop coming up uh, on the, the <laughs> academic research trying to define and measure uh, reconciliation and also um, assess the practices. Um, there's beginning to be much, much uh, better research, and we do know that some of these processes have not been as strong as others. Hmm. But where there seems to be a complete absence, the cost, as you say, in a kind of underlying fragility, no matter how strong the Indonesian state and military look, the underlying fragility at the community level, especially, and in terms of trust of a good part of the population towards uh, all authorities and their neighbors, is it's a, it's, it's, it's a very poor showing. Sarhan, Iraq certainly has a trust deficit. Um, there, uh, a lot of the issues that Susie just outlined are definitely present. How, and yet I know there's some practical examples going forward. I'd love to hear your further thoughts. Yes, yes uh, definitely. I mean, Iraq uh, probably is one of the living examples where the deficit of a trust between the community and the state is a big issue. And the, the Ba'ath Party for four, uh, over thir three decades has uh, damaged that relationship and turned it into one of fear and distrust. And uh, it, it, even if you had the best government, uh, it, it would have required uh, mending that relationship and building on that, uh, that trust. But uh, if we focus on the past 12 years, the number of shocks that hit the Iraqi society uh, has made that process even more complicated. Uh, so people coming from different backgrounds of grievances, whether you're talking about the Kurds and, uh, and, and the Shia, mostly feeling that they have been suppressed. Uh, to, to, for three decades, uh, many people in the, 
have seen that as, was it, for example, from the Kurdish angle, was it Saddam suppressing and doing these things, or was it the, the Arabs? And one of the things that important issues of leadership come into play, the Kurdish leaders have really invested in portraying this about Saddam and the Ba'ath party and not turning this into a Kurdish-Arab uh, uh, conflict. What happened uh, in, 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 the, in the other uh, the, the, uh, angle of it, uh, after 2003, the Sunni-Shia uh, 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 angle of, of, of the conflict of, and grievances and mistrust have been worked on by the politicians for political gains. So that has worsened the situation. What that meant and the accountability processes that were put in place uh, uh, for, through the, um, the, the, what was called the debatification law and after that it was changed to the accountability uh, commission, those were used for political elimination. So that deepened, that, that it has made uh, played on the deep in the mistrust in the state, uh, and also the new actors that uh, the, the, the change in Iraq brought that deepened that communal uh, distrust because uh, especially in the past two elections, uh, the, 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 the political leadership have used, uh, misused those processes for elimination and exclusion. But if we take that to the community level, uh, I think this is where we can see examples of success and uh, examples of hope. Uh, there are three or four examples that I can point to out uh, in the USIP's work uh, in Iraq where uh, Iraqi uh, facilitators trained on conflict resolution and mediation uh, have uh, found way to, re to, to resolve uh, or mit mitigate uh, or uh, reduce violence among different actors at the community level. Uh, whether we talk about the Mahmoudia example in the south of Baghdad uh, or Diyala or uh, Nineveh plains between the minorities. And even in this current time of conflict uh, between uh, with, the, with the Islamic State, many people think that at a time of conflict, uh, reconciliation is not possible. Peaceful work is not possible. Uh, the sequencing issue, many people spoke about, about, okay, do you wait until there's an agreement and then you begin reconciliation work? I think the, the, the event title has it uh, right definitely for Iraq. If you do not do reconciliation, you cannot have peace in Iraq. So leaving uh, at the macro level, leaving entire segments, uh, Sunnis out of the political process or the Kurds out of the political process, gives you uh, other other forms of conflict and violence. Uh, and after the Islamic State took, and getting back to the community level, uh, took the province of Salah ad there is a ma famous massacre called the Spiker Massacre, in which uh, ISIS killed uh, 1,700 uh, Air Force cadets and soldiers, mostly Shia, and that spanned some 20 tribes in the south and nine provinces. The potential for social violence emanating from tribal revenge, just that segment was was huge. Let, and then politicians played on that angle for political gains uh, against to, to hit Prime Minister um, Abadi and undermine him. Uh, they, they were said, okay, he could not protect the Shia. Then Shia militias used that as a, 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 a pretext for revenge, and they really had a blanket statement against uh, against the Sunnis. But again. Iraqi trained facilitators managed to find uh, ident tapped into uh, tribal relationships uh, on the Sunni side and on the Shia side and brought them together through dialogue and actually they have managed that the, 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 they could get ahead of the conflict and prevent the further escalation of the conflict. So and then gradually there were other uh, positive benefits from that uh, where the Sunni leaderships came out and said uh, the, the tribes that specific tribes that were accused came out publicly uh, said we did not do it we are uh, getting back to the concept of justice they said okay we are willing to work with the judicial process to bring the perpetrators to justice even if they are people amongst our tribes and other times, without a process that they could trust, that they could, that, 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 they, they, that, that the, uh, it was easy for the tribal leaders to default to a position of saying we would be, it would be a shame to go and ag admit uh, something or to be engaged with something that we are accused of, but we have not perpetrated. So the element of process is very important, a credible process, a method methodical, a lot of effort went into individual relationship building, bringing uh, the people together, and gradually that facilitated the return of a first batch of families to the city of Tikrit after it was liberated. It was liberated for weeks, uh, and people did not want to go back, they didn't dare to go back, because they felt that there will be revenge, they will be killed. Sunni families could not return. 
but the credible process established a relationship between the security forces, between the state, and between the tribal leaders and the, and the IDPs, the, the displaced people, they returned because they could trust the process. But that is one segment of a larger picture that, that the framework that doesn't exist. Unless you have a larger framework, uh, then you, can, you, uh, you cannot go and expand. And in Iraq right now, you need to continue bo both layers. They go hand in hand, they are inseparable. Great, thank you, Sarhang. You, you know, and Susie, you talked about forgiveness being a, a Christian concept, and a very wise uh, mentor of mine defined forgiveness as letting go of all hope of a better past. Uh, and you know, we saw a very powerful example of that when you know after the South Carolina church shootings, when the members of of uh, <laughs> Mother Emanuel Church conducted an act of public forgiveness that I think really galvanized hope and inspired people around the country. How do we, uh, without letting go of the justice aspects, without um, not enabling voices to be heard, all the issues that you raised, Ginny, how do we also bring forgiveness forward as a means of enabling the victim to move forward with their lives? And is this is there a version of this concept that exists in some of the other faith traditions? So I'll ask Susie, but and then uh, welcome others to chime in, and then we're going to open it up for questions. Yeah. Well, I wanted to start with the second part because I want to say that uh, Christianity doesn't doesn't own forgiveness. That of course it exists in in a lot of different faith traditions and outside of faith traditions as well as an element of of how to move forward after suffering has occurred, after people have harmed one another. Um, and including, I mean, all of the faith, the religious traditions in the world have dealt with conflict within their communities. And often in their sacred stories and their sacred scriptures, they talk about how to move forward after conflict has happened within families, within communities, um, within their religious institutions, between kings, between states, and so on. And often there's the element of forgiveness, as well as often go coincided with, intertwined with, the um, the acknowledgement on the part of that of the person who caused the harm. Often, both sides caused harm in some ways, um, and so acknowledgement of the wrong that was done, acknowledgement of the role in that, and then forgiveness. So it's a it's a mutual process of moving forward. But as you said, um, a wise person once said to me that if you're not able to forgive somebody who hurt you, then the power is still completely. In, um, in their hand. If you're waiting for them to acknowledge a, a harm that they did to you, then it's entirely, you're giving all of the power to them to be able to, to be free from that suffering and to move forward. And why would you want to continue to put in the hands of somebody who's already hurt you that power to, to move forward? So forgiveness can also be seen as an element of, um, of self-liberation in a way, of being able to move forward, even if you have to in the absence of that um, acknowledgement and repentance on the side of the other person. But of course, forgiveness is never something that can be imposed on anyone. It has to be a free choice that is made by an individual um, of their own decision. Otherwise, it's not going to be authentic. So what we saw in Charleston was um, incredible, and I think it was rightly heralded as incredible and almost inconceivable um, that there was the ability of, of the survivors of that violence and those who were affected by it, the families and so on, to be able to offer that kind of forgiveness. But that's not something that we can ever impose on victims lest we re-victimize them. And that's one of the controversies that came out, for example, the, the process in South Africa is there was a sense that forgiveness was being forced on victims before they were ready for it, and that created new forms of harm um, for the victims. So it's, it's important. It needs to go be coincided or be acknowledged as an important element of peace building along with acknowledgement of, of harms that were done. Um, and it's never something that can be imposed, um, but it is a, a a crucial act um, that somebody who's suffered can can take on if they're ready in order to, to move forward and take the power away from those who've caused harm. Great, thanks. Lily? 
Um, I was going to add maybe as a, as a counterpoint to Susie's, though I'm, I'm not sure about that, that um, forgiveness is also meant to absolve um, people of sins or, or crimes. And um, I, that's why I think <clears throat> it can also be a process of moral hazard. I think that's often a concern that if you um, carry out uh, an atrocity, no matter how bad, if there's a sense that at the end, the spiritual answer will be we forgive, you're looking at a, a, a very problematic um, response from the world to those kind of acts. I would say that one thing But are they mutually been, exclusive? Um, Can't you have both? I think, well, I think probably you could, but a lot of the, um, of the language puts the, puts the uh, responsibility on victims, actually. And the other thing is that one thing we know about reconciliation, it's a long-term, multi-generational uh, process, which is exactly why it's so important for peace, because uh, peace can be broken not just immediately after a peace process. Um, we did notice with the practices that we documented that they tended to tilt towards very short-term practices immediately after conflict. And of course, that's um, almost certainly because of the, the pattern of funding. And one of our findings was there's really, there are very vibrant um, areas of practice going on in places that have been considered by the international world, well, got to move on, been there, done that, and anyway, reconciliation failed. They just can't seem to, um, to manage it. And I'm thinking of, of Bosnia and much of the former Yugoslavia. And we found some really, some of our pictures here actually from um, a really interesting small local project, um, the Most Mira Bridge of Peace in the Priador region, which focuses on um, art festivals for children who are otherwise completely separated by schools. People live side by side with a lot of returned Muslim uh, refugees, but there, there's no interaction uh, between them, or it wasn't until um, a returned survivor, a Muslim survivor, returned and started this project. But he He's operating almost without without resources because there's no more funding for anything that's considered um, long term, which seems to be really where the the need is. But that's also looking at trying to make uh, reconciliation an issue for the victims and the perpetrators. Those first generation, first line people may actually not be where to look, and you may really want to look at the re the uh, the relationship. Um, several generations out because these rancors don't just, these grievances and memories, they don't just dissipate with time or with the, with the, with the appearance of a, a new, younger generation. You can find actually relationships getting worse mm -hmm. over, as, time goes uh, on. as time goes on. Yeah, so it has to be a different, a different process than forgiving the, the act itself. So really quickly, because then I want to mm -hmm. turn, quick, quick comment, Ginny, and then Sarah. Mm -hmm. I was just going to underscore the plurality of levels at which reconciliation happens and the importance of really dif differentiating whether it's individual reconciliation and forgiveness or something at a state policy level where reconciliation is being put out as a state policy um, and within that state policy recognizing that it's always an individual choice to forgive and I'd like to come back to Susie's note that this can never be forced um, victims who are unable to forgive for one reason or another because the hurt is so profound um, really shouldn't be made to feel that somehow they're out of step with the national mm -hmm. policy. Um, so I think as internationals we have to be very careful of that. And going back to the connection between forgiveness and justice, just one point, um, there are many kinds of justice and I think that we're often in the Western world and particularly in the United States used to thinking about retributive, retributive justice. That is people go to jail for their crimes, there's a trial and wrongs are found and they're punished for them. And I think that in many parts of the world and particularly in Colombia, there's a whole new development of the concepts of restorative justice and how right wrongs will be acknowledged and justice can still happen without sending everybody to jail. That you're somehow restoring the individuals on both sides, both victim and victimizer, to a community that's whole, more made more whole by that um, by that dialogue and that convivencia, I would say, the, the mm -hmm. living together. Um, and I think many Colombians talk about convivencia as opposed to reconciliation. They're two different Interesting. ideas. Sarhan, quick comment, and then I have four web questions uh, stacked up, some of which we may have slightly answered, but. Yeah, just uh, very quickly on that reconciliation in Iraq or in 
the part, the, the part of the Middle East where they're talking about Syria or elsewhere. There is a, an external factor. So we have touched upon the, 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 the direct actors who are involved in the conflict or in the dispute that led uh, to uh, the whatever problem we have today. But the external factors, like the tensions between uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran and Turkey and, the, uh, and Iran and some other countries, are complicating those reconciliation processes, and, and mm -hmm. they have the at, at moments of time they, they they contribute to raising the heat. Uh, and at the end of the day, it comes to a cost. For, for, uh, there's in that part of the world, the emotional side of this is is, is huge over the rational side of this. Uh, but then when it comes to okay, how many people I'm losing a day, how many billions I'm uh, spending on this conflict, then the actors will may come to a situation where they change uh, the, what they will accept that do not accept. But then the external factors have always complicated the Iraq angle of reconciliation. Thank you. Um, we have two questions that are almost identical, uh, which are asking for practical examples of reconciliation initiatives that help societies deal with the past, um, including one version of that coming from a Colombian peace builder. So Ginny, I think you touched on that, but um, any other uh, quick practical examples of how difficult paths have been addressed in reconciliation initiatives? I think one of the most innovative models that I've seen comes from Antioquia, um, from a, pro a process that's been created called Provisames. They're pro promoters of life and mental health. And this is a project where a women's organization, a regional women's organization that has a long history uh, in Colombia, brought together victims, women victims, of the conflict to be trained in psychosocial support techniques so that they could become a kind of mutual support group for other victims. And the concept was that they were transforming people from, from victims into citizens who had uh, the possibility of change, who had the possibility not only of internal change but also of helping fellow victims to change. Um, and this model has been incredibly supportive. Right now, um, some of the women who have been involved in this have also been involved in a project that we're doing to train women mediators. And in the course of training women mediators, they got to know some ex-combatants. And they are now bringing ex-combatants from the groups that victimized these women victims hmm. into the mix. So you're moving from kind of a, a psychosocial healing process, which is, I think, often a first stage before you can even get to reconciliation. You have to heal, you have to be healed enough to even consider the, and empath to be able to empathize with another. Um, but I think they're moving from a psychosocial process to then an engagement process where they're open enough to hear other points of view from their victimizers. And I think this kind of very slow, gradual, um, finding a safe space and creating a safe community in which to discuss these issues is really important before you can get to a point of bringing victimizers and victims together. So following on the practical, uh, there's a question that says, recently in Sierra Leone, there's been a mass destruction of property and housing in Freetown, leaving thousands of internally displaced people. What advice can you give to the government, affected persons, and civil nonviolence groups calling for restoration of justice and fair housing rights. Good examples, sage advice. Well, I would say the first step is know your rights. I mean, people need to be trained in what are the protections that they're offered under their own national laws mm -hmm. and under international laws. And then once you know what those rights are, figure out who's defending those rights and link in with organizations that can where, where you can make a difference and you can help them make a difference. Great, and while they're answering, anybody who has questions, are we asking you people, we're gonna take the mics around? So raise your hand if you have a comment or a question and we'll bring the mic to you. So we'll, go ahead. Yeah, Sarah. and uh, I think breaking down where the source of the problem, sometimes a blanket um, uh, statement about if the state has done this or this group has done this uh, is not helpful. At the end of the day, it comes to probably a failed process, an individual. Uh, so you uh, don't go, breaking it down to uh, those, those uh, uh, se segments is very important. Great, so we have a lot of people who have thoughtful comments, experience to share. Sir, you first. Yeah, I have a question about timing. Uh, 
is it is it important to consider the timing of when reconciliation or acts of reconciliation are introduced uh, to a conflict? Can a conflict be too fresh or too new or too recent? Uh, could you prematurely engage in a reconciliation process that would be either counterproductive or totally unhelpful? Uh, or if there's conflict still around in the area, in other words, do you have to have a complete absence of conflict for reconciliation to work? And then I think a corollary or another question related to timing is, are there situations where the fragility of the, of the, of the, of the social fabric is such, uh, you don't have conflict, but you have the elements of conflict that could be imminent, that you could introduce reconciliation as a preventive technique or a preventive mm -hmm. measure? But great questions. We're going to take one more while the panel reflects. Thank you for giving me a word. And um, first of all, I want to thank uh, uh, the Institute of Peace uh, very much uh, for organizing this event. Because uh, uh, is this on? Is this on? Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the Institute of Peace for organizing this wonderful event because what we are talking, discussing now, I think it's a fundamental, uh, the most fundamental question in our civilization, in our world, because without peace, uh, no life, no future. So thank you very much for giving uh, us the opportunity to hear your opinion, to share our opinions. My name is Svetlana Stanford. I, I was born in the former Soviet Union, and I know that Virginia lived uh, uh, maybe in some of, I mean, maybe in Russia or maybe in, in, in another republic of the Soviet Union. So, and I have Russian and Ukrainian roots, hmm. you know. And what is happening now in uh, Donbass makes me very, very, very upset. And, um, uh, I try to understand why it happened. Of course, I understand it's a political game. So many. And um, uh, the history, what we had, uh, Russian and Ukrainians, uh, it's like one family. Uh, we belong to the same, talking about religion, we belong to the same church. Uh, we are Orthodox. Uh, we fight it together. Uh, um, against Nazis. We uh, suffered from hunger uh, when Stalin time was. So we had a lot, a lot in common. We have the same fate. We have the same history. Why it happened? Why um, uh, one brother who lives in uh, Kiev hates the brother, uh, his brother who lives in Moscow? It happens. It's real. So I would like to know um, each of your opinion about what is uh, the first step, uh, or maybe the main step, uh, in a reconciliation, uh, which br bring, uh, I mean, to, to the peace, to the long peace in that area. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Um, and sadly, it's a lot of these conflicts are happening between communities who have historically been very, very close. So uh, timing. Uh, and can it be preventative? Can it be too fresh? And how to address these kinds of, of terrible... Uh... Go ahead, Lily. Uh, on the timing question, I think uh, we know it's difficult to get what we call now empirical evidence about uh, questions like this, but I suspect that we may have had a <clears throat> premature um, rush to reconcili reconciliation activities at the time of the Oslo agreement between Palestinians and Israelis. <clears throat> and um, with, the, with the continuation of conflict, people lost faith in each other and faith in the process. And you even had the backlash of the Palestinians beginning to believe this was not a positive process, but one of so-called <clears throat> normalization of, of an occupation. And I sometimes wonder if that was a case where, uh, where timing was, was really off. Sarhan, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, very quick, I think timing is very important. Uh, but uh, as I mentioned, to me, Iraq is an example where 
uh, even if you don't have a full-fledged process, there you could build toward that process. There are steps that you can take uh, at uh, at state level, community level, and one of the investments that I see is a great investment in civil society organizations and, and looking for uh, elements in the community and the culture and the tradition to tap into our, our critical. In Iraq, uh, we have been successful in, in tapping into the tribal traditions that bring communities back together in the roles of religious leaders that help, could, could uh, play a, a positive role. And I think it's important to also remember, even in the most peaceful society, uh, peace not an end state that you reach and you it stays. It, you have to keep investing in retaining that status. Uh, look at Whether you look at the United States or other countries in the Europe, uh, I think understanding what keeps peace uh, and how you preserve it is an important one to be able to help uh, those communities uh, where we, we operate in the conflict zones, Where how do we get them there? Which goes to your preventive issue. Uh, Ginny, did you want to come in? Sure. Quickly? Um, quickly, just recognize Svetlana. It's wonderful to see you. And your, your question about what the first step of, of reconciliation for peace is, your husband was engaged in high-level human rights dialogues between the US and Soviet Union at a very quiet level. Those kinds of initiatives between academics, policymakers, church and religious leaders, um, communities, I think set the groundwork, a kind of preventive, but also a potential resolution can be, um, can be shaped by having those kinds of interactions. Very quickly, and I'll answer them both in one. Um, if we think of reconciliation as the restoration of right relationships, then you can begin that immediately, right? And that, as Sarhang was saying, that reconciliation is also the process by which you seek to achieve and then sustain peace by constantly working on restoring the relationship between communities, between the state and civil society. And that the first step for that is then engagement <laughs> between the state and civil society, between the different communities who've been in conflict with one another at the personal level, but also at the corporate level. Svetlana, I would also just echo something Sarhang said about Iraq, where it's the, um, the interference of neighbors and of the region sometimes that can disrupt what or inflame relationships that were otherwise peaceful. And if you haven't already met our executive vice president, Ambassador Taylor, please do so uh, because of some initiatives that we're working on at the community level on uh, building peaceful relationships starting now among communities. Okay, over here, yeah. and then where's our other mic? Yeah, this woman in the checker. Yeah, and then we'll go now. Good morning, and um, thanks very much to the panel for, for your words so far. Often in, in these post-conflict situations, there are so many perpetrators of crimes, hundreds of thousands in some cases, that it becomes very difficult for courts set up to actually process uh, and deal with, with each individual case. It definitely was the case in Rwanda, and, and definitely the case in Kosovo as well. So would it be fair to say that reconciliation is and forgiveness is a second best option which is necessary and often um, you know, inevitable in cases where retributive justice uh, can't be given out and, 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 and can't be processed in, in, in these kinds of situations. Thanks. Thank you. We'll take over here and yeah, and go my, ahead. My question is specifically for Ms. Bovier. Um, you had mentioned earlier the importance of defining actors and victims in a conflict, and I was wondering, does that mean that you have to determine a common national narrative, or is there a way around that process, because that in itself is often very problematic? Okay, and one more. We'll take three at a time right here, and then go to our next batch. Hi. Greetings. I'm Upe Makwan, an ambassador for peace from Nigeria. I would appreciate uh, answers as to what measures may be taken where at peace building where reconciliation fails. Thank you. Okay. Three chewy questions. Jenny? Well, I'll just take the one that was directed to me and leave my colleagues for the others. But the question of defining actors and victims and whether there needs to be a common national narrative. Um, just an anecdote. The peace table, the FARC and the government of Colombia um, decided that there would, the first step for understanding who the victims were, were was to establish a historical commission on the conflict and its victims. And they named 12 academics 
who were of good repute, you know, independent-minded, et cetera, um, to produce reports on the nature of the conflict and the impacts that it had on society, um, and assigned two rapporteurs or two rapporteurs who would then reconcile these 12 reports that were produced and produce one narrative that would say these are the areas where there's agreement about the conflict and these are the areas where there's disagreement. In the end, there were 14 reports produced. The two rapporteurs could not reconcile what was out there. They were so different and so dramatically different that there was no, no possibility of reconciling. I think that these 14 reports actually are a useful input but they also tell us just how fragmented the society is in looking at the conflict and even understanding who's responsible, let alone who's the victim. So no, I don't think there's a single national narrative. I think there are people that may be trying to create a single national narrative, but right now I think people just need to listen to each other and, and then there's, a, there's going to be a process to get to some sort of conciliation of versions, um, but I'm not sure that there will ever be one single version of the Colombian conflict. Um, so in trying to respond to the very interesting question that mentioned um, Kosovo, it seems to me that uh, maybe because I um, am more of a uh, natural cheerleader for including justice, it seems to, hard to believe that you could not find sort of the chief, what we call conflict entrepreneurs, and find a way to at least bring those people to justice, even if we know that that will never really answer the calls for justice. And there may be people who are looking for the neighbor that they know who abused them to actually that justice for that person would be more important than people at the top. But even in Rwanda, there were high level uh, conflict entrepreneurs who were judged and there would seem to be some violence in that and some value in them. Sorry. Um, but it seems to me that reconciliation in any case is never second best, that this is justice is almost never, never going to be sufficient. So these processes really, these alternative or other processes have to be um, really given uh, as much stature and importance. Um, and these can, they're always needed, and there are so many different forms. I mean, are we thinking of truth processes, which the jury is out uh, on the value of them, but it seems to be very important. People return to the idea of this as being um, deeply appealing. And um, the other processes which try to bring uh, people together where they can at the grassroots level and to have statements from other important uh, leaders of the country calling for new beginnings. Uh, there are so many different forms that I think they're, it's, it's a landscape that's not second best, but also absolutely necessary. Great, thanks. Susie? <clears throat> I want to um, second a lot of what Lily has said, but I also want to um, give a caution that we don't want to conflate political amnesty and forgiveness as a personal process. So a lot of what I was speaking to earlier was about a personal decision um, for forgiveness, which doesn't preclude justice and accountability, and that reconciliation itself doesn't preclude justice and accountability. These are very overlapping processes. Um, but then also to say in terms of practical things too on the ground, that there are some really great um, given that it can be impossible to hold accountable all of those who are involved in violent conflict situations, there are some examples of some good processes, not, not perfect, but good processes on the ground where communities have created their own mechanisms for holding accountable. Northern Uganda with the Monte Oput and Mozambique and other places where when combat in, in Colombia increasingly, including with the group we support, the Ecumenical Women's Peace Building Network, processes where when combatants come back into their communities, there's ways in which the local community can come together and have um, a process of accounting for what that person did, the harms they created to their communities, and then how they're going to um, be held accountable to it within the community to ensure that, that they're living within the community in a way that, um, that doesn't replicate the harms of the past. Okay, let's do another round. Uh, this gentleman here, and then uh, the gentleman in the blue shirt. We'll try to move towards the back. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Limber, and to our panel today for having us. Uh, my name is Emmanuel Davali Hidalgo. I'm a Venezuelan citizen, uh, and I'm basically interested to hear um, what are your uh, perspectives on some grassroots initiatives that are currently taking place in Venezuela for national reconciliation and of course being based at the at grassroots level are facing um, several pitfalls because of the lack of will from the state actors to sort of not only uh, allow for these initiatives to take traction at the national level 
um, but also to engage in them even. So, I mean, is it possible really to um, for civil society actors to mobilize um, a wider portion of the population when there is uh, such a high level political conflict yet to be resolved? Um, and so, it, does this have any prospects for prevention uh, at the grassroots level at least? Thank you. That sounds like a lot of countries. That sounds like a lot of countries. Um, oh, yeah, over here. Good morning, and, and thanks to everyone in the panel for a really fascinating discussion. My question is about Guatemala, um, specifically if the example of the political events of this year is relevant for this discussion. Even though we're almost 20 years out from the Guatemalan Peace Accords um, and the scandals and political protests resulting in the president and vice president of Guatemala resigning and being imprisoned this year were directly caused by corruption. Heard a lot of coverage about um, how it's largely a response to the open wounds um, and the lack of reconciliation of almost 20 years ago. Um, so do you think that there's an example here um, specifically for the role of international institutions such as the UN um, Commission Against Impunity, which has been really um, key in Guatemala? Thank you. Right, and can you pass the mic directly behind you to the gentleman? Oh, oh, OK, sorry, I didn't see either. Yeah. Uh, thank you. My name is uh, Fortuné Kegirwa from uh, the Central African Republic you mentioned earlier. Central Africa Republic. Uh, yes. Yes, welcome. My, thank you. My concern is about uh, uh, the population who wants to go to um, reconciliation. The international community, which is um, every involved in the situation in Central Africa, is pushing us to elections. What kind of peace we can reach? While the population wants to go to reconciliation and the international communi uh, community wants us to go to election. Thank you. Uh, that is such an important question. The, 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 and I think uh, Susie and uh, actually everybody up here underscored at the beginning the importance of listening uh, to local voices as one moves forward. And I think there's a lot of examples of where elections have crystallized differences as opposed to enabled a collective healing to go forward. So you raise a really important question. Three good questions. Um, Jeannie, do you want to get us started off? Because there are two Latin American specific questions. And then Sarhang, you may want to talk about the grassroots approaches. Ginny? Sure. I would, I would say with regard to the grassroots initiatives in Venezuela, that oftentimes when there's not reconciliation at the national level or there's not dialogue or there's not any kind of peace process in sight, that's when people get um, kind of jump the gun and say, well, we're just going to do reconciliation anyway at the local level. And I think that's what I saw happening in Colombia. There was no peace process back in 2007, 2008, but people wanted the war to end and they wanted to figure out how to live with the war going on around them in a more humane way. And so you had a lot of reconciliation and peace building initiatives happening before you had a peace process. And I think that's what's happening in Venezuela as well. People are taking things into their own hand and saying, well, if they're not going to kind of resolve all these things quietly at the top, we're going to have to do it here. Now, the, the problem is that you often have a disconnect between what's happening locally and what's happening nationally. And I think we're seeing the impact of that now in Colombia. You have a lot of groups doing peace building at a local and regional level, and they're having a hard time connecting to the national process. USIP has actually been supporting quite a number of projects that specifically set out to connect their process to a national process. And they've actually served as a kind of mechanism for what the government has, has labeled as territorial peace. You know, we want peace once we sign the accord in Havana. We want peace to come to the regions. How do we do that? Well, one of the ways you do that is you have people who are uh, interested in reconciliation and peace issues and talking about it and dialoguing. You have those, as pa those people as partners who can help ground the national policies and help implement a peace accord at, accord at the local level. On Guatemala, absolutely relevant for today's discussion. I'm so over here. Um, and I think the question of sequencing and the question of timing is the one that, that jumps out at you. Um, peace building and creating a culture of peace, which includes a culture that's transparent, that's democratic, all of these things takes time and it takes generations. But people who were working for peace in, in Guatemala continued to work 
for peace and transparency and democratization of structures and elimination of political exclusion and discrimination, all these things that I think contribute, contributed to the movement that basically ousted the president in, in Guatemala. And I think the internationals played an important role. CICIC was a, a key institution um, coming from outside that allowed the investigation of some of these, these uh, structures of corruption that had permeated the, the Guatemalan state. Thank you. Sarhan, quick reflections. We're, it, it, for peop, since we started so late, I'd like to stay five more minutes and take one more round of questions in a lightning round. So we'll, we'll all be super succinct, but there's good, good questions coming. Yeah, I think um, uh, civil society is an important element uh, where, which, regardless of the conflict zone and the country you're talking about because uh, political parties could come and go, political leaders could come and go. I think investment in civil society is the constant that can survive different political uh, 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 cycles. That's one. So it's, it's a worthwhile investment. And second is they are a contribution part of the cultural change that you need because at the end of the day, the, the end state of peace and maintaining peace, uh, civil society is that partner that can help you uh, take that uh, co those concepts and play their role uh, 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 effectively. And in Iraq, a country that had zero civil society uh, before, I would say, 1991, it's, it's the Kurdistan region of Iraq had an earlier start. The rest of Iraq before 2003, zero civil society. I could say, and, and I've spent most of my life in Iraq and worked uh, mostly in Iraq, is that the civil society, I would say, slowed down uh, the, the, the sliding of the com communities and the country into violence in, in the following years. Because the, the more it, we invested in them, the, the more they tapped into the communities, the more they tried, they slowed down. Whatever we have today would have been worse had we not had civil society. The more investment we can, uh, we have a strong partner that we can engage with. But this is where the international community can play an important role in the prevention aspect also. And uh, I mentioned Spiker. The, uh, earlier, early det civil society can work as an early detection mechanism. They can give you a sign of what is what's coming at you, and then you can uh, you can work with that. Great. So, any final burning lightning round questions? We'll we'll start with the the woman next door to our car questioner. Yeah, and then this gentleman here. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, thank you. My name is Josiane Dumbay. I'm from Central African Republic too. Uh -huh. uh, uh, my question is, what kind of strategy we gonna put on place, place uh, to start with the reconciliation? Because the conflict in my country, first it was political co conflict, and now it become an uh, religion conflict between Muslim and Christian, and in center, uh, in some of the place, in the capital, even in the the other city, all a lot of Muslim move to the country. They are in Ch Chad or Sudan. They lost everything, no house, nothing. So how? We're going to start with that reconciliation because uh, I know that the governor cannot do nothing for them. So how are we going to do that? Mm -hmm. Even they got nothing back home, nowhere to live. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, gentlemen? Um, so I understand the role of the Peace Tech Lab, oh, the Peace Tech Lab in um, reducing conflict in these different affected countries. But what role, if any, does technology play in the reconciliation process? And how does the Peace lab, Tech Lab come into play with that? Good question. Okay. Last, last, um, qu last question, unless Kathleen, you have a burning comment? OK. Great. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm from Guatemala, and I lived in Eastern Europe. And so I studied the transitions of Spain, Hungary, and Guatemala, which seemed really odd to most people, with the exception of something that Lilia mentioned today, which was, decades later when you haven't done anything or you've done very little or if you're limited in the case of Guatemala you haven't wanted to name you know what happens and what are the cost and what is the co the consequences of doing that and so I wanted to bring back to what Lily had mentioned she mentioned Indonesia as a case where you know there we have decades now later to look back and I wanted to see if there are other cases if there are any other studies that you guys wanted to bring up in this issue of 
what happens when you don't do much or you don't do anything or you cover up. I mean, Hungary for me is such a you know great example of that as well as my country. So. Great. Okay. And Kathleen. Thank you. I sure. wanted to uh, just pick up on the technology moving forward, but I also wanted to ask the question, what is a good example of who gets to write the history of a conflict? What role does it play in reconciliation? What role education plays moving forward? Great. Thank you very much. That's an excellent question. So um, these are all huge. We'll be very short. Lily, do you want to talk about who gets to write it and the impact of uh, no process? Sure. Um, yeah, on the process of education, there's actually, again, we don't really um, know the connections. It's very hard to look at the long-term effects of education, and there's a, UNICEF is, is um, funding a big study right now of education and peace building. Um, I will say, and I don't know really what the uh, sort of empirical evidence is, but it's impressive that in Northern Ireland since the, since the early 90s, um, school textbooks have been written by completely integrated teams of textbook writers. And I think generally it's felt that the way history is taught, Irish history is taught in the classroom, Northern Irish history, is actually reasonably fair. It's a question of what can the teachers dare to touch upon, what narratives do the children bring into the classroom, and what are the long-term effects of, and this is being studied a bit, what do children understand about history um, a couple of years after leaving that particular history class. And gender integrated as well. Uh, yeah, I think <laughs> I'm just positive Kathleen yes. was pushing us to make that comment. Yeah, well, presumably gender education. I don't know if we can take that for granted. But this goes to the, the role of education. Mm -hmm. But women, have, uh, women are certainly well represented in the peace uh, process, uh, in the civil society work for peace in Northern Ireland, and hopefully that's true also in the education Great. community. Thank you. Um, on no process, um, we don't have a study going on right now it's hard to prove a negative and and really show causation but um it's it's certainly a, a critical a, a, a critical question i, I think we've just yeah. had a good idea put on the table yes. um okay a yes. couple of Thank comments you. around technology uh um, quickly jenny and then okay, I, won't I won't address the peace tech lab per se but i will just say a word a broader word about the role of social media and peace building because i think it it I don't want to overstate it because in many countries you don't have the technology for even iPhones, let alone, or you know, for iPhones, let alone for any kind of campaign. But in Colombia, it is social media is being used to either attack the peace process, and Uribe, the former president, has has really. Um, broken new ground in how he's using the media to mobilize a population against a peace process. And you have other sectors that are trying to respond, but there's very little, um, very little success in those sectors. Um, USIP has commissioned a study on the role of social media in vis-a-vis -vis the peace process in Colombia. We hope to have it out in a couple of months. Um, and I think it has some very interesting findings about the different messaging, the different kinds of messaging that can be supportive or play a role in, in countering the possibilities for reconciliation. And of course, we've seen the role of social media in the Guatemala example of mobilizing That's peaceful right. civil resistance. Right. Yeah. yeah. Sarhan. Yeah, I mean, just to Richard, I think technology is a double-edged sword. Uh, we've seen it used by people to great use to, uh, to, 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 to spread peaceful messages, but I've also we've seen it, so organizations like ISIS use it to, for, for destruction. So uh, I think investment in the civil society, in the government, uh, institutions of government to engage with the, uh, with, with the community is an important one because the, 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 the good actors are lagging behind in terms of the use of good technology in the conflict zone. So investing there uh, will have a lot of benefit. But I think it's also important that technology at the end of the day is a tool. So going out, and one of the things that I have shortfalls, that I have pitfalls I've seen in the, in the Middle East is that they train on the use of technology. But if you don't have a message to give to the people, if you don't have a good practice to serve to the people, it could backfire against you. It, could, it just becomes a propaganda tool. But it's an important tool, which is why we work closely yes. with Peace Tech Lab around the world. Beyond social media, too, though, is the role that technology can play in creating inclusive processes for reconciliation and truth commissions and so on. So I don't want to forget that piece beyond social media of how technology has been used in order to ensure that those from across a nation in conflict zone are able to participate in and receive the, 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 um, 
radio feed and so on of tooth commission processes that are going on. I wanted to go back to the question from Carr um, and say, first of all, of course, reparations and restoration of land loss, of houses lost, and so on are an important part of reconciliation um, and these larger processes. But I also wanted to get at some of the religious elements of the question you asked, because we've been focusing a lot on the role of religious ideas, um, the role of religious actors and religious leaders, and um, although we haven't focused on it, also I think important to acknowledge is the role of religious institutions in helping to institutionalize some of these reconciliation processes and ensure, for example, truth commissions. Guatemala is a great example of that with Archbishop Girardi. Um, the use of um, religious networks and, and places of worship and so on in order to gather information, to reach out to survivors of, of violence and and to advance some of these processes. But we also have to acknowledge that um, there's a need in the aftermath of political violence in some contexts to um, deal with, to understand how religion was used in order to fuel violence and how religious actors and religious institutions and religious ideas perpetuated exclusion or bias or violence itself. And, um, and thinking about how to advance mechanisms and processes and dialogue in order to understand that fully so that you can trust in religious institutions as well. And um, what's often not acknowledged in the South African um, Truth and Reconciliation Commission, there's sort of all of the acknowledgement of the positive role that re religious institutions and ideas and actors played in helping to advance that process. But one element of it that's often forgotten is that there was actually a process by which white South African church leaders were brought in order to testify about how they had helped to create some of the theological, ideological infrastructure that had contributed to apartheid. And that that was a way in which the, the community and the country was able to, to reckon with how religion had fueled the oppression and the violence there. And so those mm. processes need not, it cannot be forgotten um, in the aftermath of violent conflict as well. Great, thank you. Um, I want to once again thank everybody for joining us this morning, for staying. I'm sorry for the late start. Um, I wish we could keep going. There's a lot of uh, rich experience here in the room from a lot of different perspectives. Thank you for joining us this morning. I want to once again urge you to participate in the Peace Day Challenge, uh, hashtag Peace Day Challenge. Um, and uh, thank you again for coming. Please join me in thanking our panelists for today.